Welcome to the fourth and final week of the congenital heart disease lecture series for pediatric residents rotating through the PICU. Thus far, we've talked about tetralogy of Fallot, high yield arrhythmias, cardiomyopathy, and myocarditis. Um, week four will close out this lecture series, but my hope is to continue with, with bonus material that, that should include interesting and pertinent topics in congenital heart disease that, that would be valuable to you guys. But until then, let's, let's close it out here with week four. Enjoy. Grab a pencil and a piece of paper for the next slide coming up, and I'll have you write down your diagnoses for the cases that we talk about. All right, let's consider the following four cases. Case one, a four-hour-old male, born at term, APGARs of eight and eight, presenting with a cyanotic spell during a crying event. Exam reveals a harsh systolic murmur heard best over the pulmonic area. Pulse ox on the right hand and right foot at the time of the event are both 75%. CPAP is placed with an FiO2 of 100% and the spell does not resolve. Case number two, a four-hour-old male, born at term, APGARS of 8 and 9, who is noted to be cyanotic on routine checkup with mother and baby in the postpartum unit. Exam reveals a continuous murmur transmitted to the back. Pulse ox on the right hand reveals a SAT of 75% and 90% on the right foot. CPAP is placed with an FiO2 of 100% and the spell does not resolve. A chest x-ray reveals an egg on a string appearance with egg-shaped heart and narrow mediastinum. Case number 3. A three-day-old female, born at term, APGARS of 8 and 9, who is brought to the ED by parents for lethargy, pale gray discoloration, and coolness to the touch. On exam, a harsh murmur is auscultated over the aortic area, and baby is, to is toxic in appearance with mottled skin and cap refill of 5 seconds. Strong upper extremity pulses are appreciated with non-palpable femoral pulses. Pulse ox in the right upper extremity is 98% and in the right lower extremity, 83%. Mean arterial pressure in the right upper extremity is 45 and 30 in the right lower extremity. Finally, case four, a three-day-old female born at term, APGARS of eight and nine, who was brought to the ED by parents for lethargy, pale gray discoloration and coolness to the touch. On exam, no murmur is auscultated and the baby is toxic in appearance with mottled skin and cap refill of five seconds. She has weak brachial and femoral pulses. Her temp is 34.5 degrees Celsius. A pulse ox cannot be picked up on the hands or feet. So jot down a, a diagnosis for each of these four cases, and we'll talk about them in the next slide. All right, so you've had an opportunity to write down your um, diagnoses for each of these cases. Let's go over the right answers, and then... Uh, we'll tie all of these together into a common thread that is really the takeaway point for this, for this whole lecture today. Case number one was an example of critical pulmonary valve stenosis where you have uh, severely limited blood flow to the lungs outside of the right, you know, the right ventricle due to some critical uh, uh, pulmonary outflow tract restriction. Um, so you have insufficient pulmonary blood flow the, the blood flow to the lungs is gonna to have to come from another source. And we'll, we'll get to that at the end, what, what that source would be. Um, case number two, this is the child with a differential cyanosis with uh, O2 saturation higher in the lower extremity. That's kind of unique, right? We're not used to seeing that. Um, the child has a continuous murmur. They have an egg on a string appearance on their chest X-ray. These are all consistent with a case of complete transposition, transposition of the great arteries with an intact atrial septum. We'll get to an illustration of this in a couple of slides, but this is really a, a very fascinating example of, of a, a circuit in, uh, in parallel, as opposed to a healthy heart, which is a, a, a circuit in series. These are actually two parallel circuits that in order for the child to survive and have adequately, uh, adequately oxygenated blood servicing both the, the pulmonary circuit and the systemic circuit, there's gonna need to be something connecting those two 
And so we'll talk about that in a little while. Case number three, this is the three day old, that time period is very important, who comes in in almost a shock-like appearance. Very poor perfusion with a differential in the upper extremity compared to the lower extremity. This is a classic case of coarctation of the aorta. What's notable here, well, this is a case not really of cyanosis, maybe some mild cyanosis <clears throat> in the lower extremities, but um, more importantly, more pertinent, more pertinent is the profound restriction to systemic blood flow uh, due to this um, critical coarct that's, that's impeding adequate systemic blood flow. So in order for um, blood flow to uh, circumvent that and, and get out to the body, there's going to need to be a bypass. Case number four, the final case here, another three-day-old, once again, very important time, uh, time frame. Um, this baby has no murmur, but again appears shocky and has such poor perfusion you can't even pick up um, uh, pulse ox on the hands or the feet. This would be an example of a hypoplastic left heart uh, where the ductus at three days of life now has closed. The baby has no way to provide adequate blood flow to the systemic circuit, so they're shunting virtually all of their blood or, or the vast majority of their blood to the pulmonary circuit and they'll present in a shock-like appearance. So what's the common thread here? What ties all of these pieces uh, in red to a, a, a common need? Um, the answer is ductal dependence, and we'll talk about that in the slides to come. Ductal dependent lesions are really fascinating to me, and the history behind these are, are very, very cool. The evolution of congenital heart disease interventions and surgeries and how they've come along the last 70 years is really fascinating. If you're interested in it, uh, look up Helen Tausig and Alfred Blaylock and, and Vivian Thomas. Really, really fascinating history. Um, how the importance of ductal dependence in certain uh, cardiac lesions came about. Uh, but essentially, I divided in my brain into, into three camps. Number one is its own camp. Um, and is so unique, it, it should be easy to remember. Those are the, the parallel circuits that need uh, some, some connection between them. That's the transposition of the great artery. That's camp number one that's very on its own and unique. And we'll talk in a moment why that's really not a long-term solution, the, the patent ductus, why it's not a long-term solution to uh, someone with a TGA. Camp number two is like case number one on the last slide, someone with severe or even non-existent pulmonary blood flow. And when that ductus closes, there's really severely limited or, or absent blood flow to the lungs, and you need to do something uh, to augment that, and that's opening the PDA to allow blood flow from the aorta to the pulmonary arteries and, and hence onto the lungs. Now, this is, I talked about those uh, three pioneers in, in congenital heart disease. That's where this uh, came about initially was of these blue tet babies, um, Helen Tausig uh, realized that those who had a patent ductus tended to do longer uh, than the ones whose ductus had closed. And, and through that observation and advancing uh, cardiac surgery, they were able to uh, devise the BTT shunt or the Blaylock Tausig Thomas shunt um, as a way to augment pulmonary blood flow in these TET babies who had severely limited or even absent uh, pulmonary blood flow. So pretty fascinating. That's camp number two. Camp number three is like case three and four on the previous slide. Those are the ones who have severely restricted systemic blood flow. And so a critical coart, for example, um, a hypoplastic left heart, for example. Um, these, these babies, once their ductus closes, they'll present almost in a shock-like appearance with very, very poor perfusion. Um, they'll need their ductus uh, opened in order to uh, have blood flow the opposite direction, right? Pulmonary artery across the PDA uh, to the aorta and then, then down the aorta to the rest of the body. Um, that's, how, that's how they'll perf perfuse uh, their systemic circuit. So three camps, the parallel circuits who need some sort of connecting, uh, connecting shunt the severely limited pulmonary blood flow, and then the severely limited systemic blood flow.
this is a pretty straightforward slide. I just wanted to include so you have a mental image of what a PDA looks like. Thank you to UCSF and their website for including this image, and, and I've borrowed it from, uh, from them for, for, for this presentation. Um, on the left-hand side, you see a normal heart with the remnants of a PDA known as a ligamentum arteriosum, and this is just a fibrous band of tissue um, in which no blood is, is flowing across it. Um, the right-hand side, you see the PDA, the patent ductus arteriosus, that does indeed have, have blood flow uh, shunting across it. Uh, we talked about our three camps, our three congenital heart lesion categories where a patent ductus is going to be necessary. If you've diagnosed one of those conditions and, and you need to maintain a patent ductus, um, the therapy for that, as I'm, I'm sure you guys have all uh, come across at this point in your careers, would be uh, prostaglandin E, PGE, prostin. We use all of those, those names uh, synonymously. Um, there are, of course, scenarios where a PDA is pathologic and an otherwise healthy baby who has a, a patent ductus that fails to close. Over time, that child will shunt excessive blood flow left or right into their pulmonary artery and with time develop pulmonary hypertension and right-sided heart failure. Um, so that would be a pathologic condition caused by a patent ductus. Um, but again, when we've identified uh, any of those three camps of, of congenital heart disease uh, conditions where a patent ductus is necessary, starting uh, prostin in order to maintain a patent ductus uh, is the right decision. Just to shift gears a little bit, I wanted to cover this um, in case it comes up on your boards. This doesn't really have explicitly to do with uh, PDAs, but uh, other considerations for, for ductal dependent lesions. Let's think about this question, and in the next two slides, we'll answer, we'll answer this question. When is an atrial septostomy indicated? A, in a complete transposition of the great arteries with an intact atrial septum, and B, a hypoplastic left heart with intact atrial septum, C, an AV septal defect, or D, tetralogy of Fallot with intact atrial septum. So the first correct answer to this question is complete TGA with an intact atrial septum. Uh, the reasoning behind this isn't quite intuitive, so let's, let's talk about this uh, for a moment. Uh, we know that in TGA, the aorta is arising from the right ventricle. So in this scenario, venous blood is returning, as it normally would, to the right atrium, right atrium to right ventricle, right ventricle out to the aorta, and then from the aorta to the body, body back to the right atrium. And so you have this uh, series in, in parallel that's just circulating deoxygenated blood. No, no oxygenation is occurring here. A separate series in parallel occurring in this heart lesion is the left side of the heart. So you have pulmonary veins bringing oxygenated blood back to the left atrium left atrium to left ventricle, left ventricle out to the pulmonary artery, and then of course pulmonary artery to the lungs, lungs to the pulmonary veins, pulmonary veins to the left atrium. And so you're shunting oxygenated blood solely to the left side of the heart uh, into the lungs in, in, in that parallel circuit. So unless there's a communication here, there's gonna be no way to oxygenate, to oxygenate the blood supplying the body, right? What we can do in the first few hours, maybe even a couple of days of life, is keep their ductus open, and that will provide uh, blood flow. Uh, as the pulmonary vascular resistance is high in that pulmonary artery, that'll provide blood flow from the pulmonary artery uh, across the patent ductus to the aorta and you know from the aorta to the body. Uh, but as pulmonary vascular resistance falls, and, and nearly every baby it will, um, that blood is across the patent ductus is preferentially going to shunt from the aorta to the pulmonary artery rather than vice versa. So now you're having deoxygenated blood flow from the aorta to the pulmonary artery, and then that that blood within the pulmonary artery circuit is is really not getting across to to the aorta and, and to the body. 
And so we know that as pulmonary vascular resistance falls, a patent ductus is just not a good solution. So how do we, how do we overcome this? There needs to be some sort of intracardiac connection. So some of these babies will be born with a, a VSD and that will provide uh, a means for them to, to shunt blood uh, and, and, and mix that blood so that some oxygenated blood is getting out to the body. Uh, in babies that are born with an intact ventricular septum and an intact atrial septum, what we'll do is perform an atrial septostomy. Um, we'll create a, uh, essentially a, an iatrogenic uh, atrial uh, septal defect so that they can shunt blood and get oxygenated blood across to the, to the aorta um, and then aorta out to the body. And the second correct answer to the question posed two slides ago is hypoplastic left heart with intact atrial septum. This one again is a little bit tricky, so let's, let's walk through it. We know that venous blood returning in, in deoxygenated fashion from the body to the right side of the heart will drain into the right atrium, from the right atrium to the right ventricle, right ventricle out to the pulmonary arteries, to the lungs, from the lungs, uh, via the pulmonary veins back to the left atrium. And then depending on the degree of mitral atresia or mitral stenosis, may or may not pass into the left ventricle. And then depending on the degree of uh, aortic stenosis or aortic atresia, may or may not pass in some very limited fashion, perhaps not at all, uh, out the aorta and to the rest of the body. And so let's take the, the scenario of the baby with uh, complete aortic atresia. Once that blood reaches the um, LV, uh, assuming the, vin the uh, ventricular septum's intact, there's really nowhere for it to go except backflow. And once it reaches the left atrium, there's really nowhere for it to go except backflow. And so then how are you getting that oxygenated blood sitting in the left side of the heart um, out to the body? Uh, we know that these babies are, are dependent on their on their patent ductus, but if you can't even uh, shunt blood uh, integrate out the left ventricle into the aorta, how are you going to get how are you going to get blood to the to the rest of the body? Um, at least blood that's oxygenated. These babies are dependent on an atrial septum, uh, and in that fashion, the blood will shunt uh, left to right from the left atrium to the right atrium. And then from there, right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary artery. And then some of that blood in the pulmonary artery will shunt right to left from the pulmonary artery to the aorta and then provide um, adequately oxygenated blood. Of course, it's not going to be normally saturated blood of 95, 100%. It's more likely to be 75 to 85% saturations, but adequately in order you know, to, maintain, uh, to maintain life. Um, so these, these babies will, will be dependent on an atrial septum as well. Uh, and so a very important question to ask if, if a baby with hypoplastic left heart is born to you is, is there ASD present? Is it restricted? Is it unrestricted? If it's anything besides unrestricted, they're going to need an atrial septostomy in order to create that intraatrial communication. All right, guys. Great talk this week. This is material that I really love, that I'm really passionate about. I hope that maybe some of my enthusiasm has passed off to you guys. Let's just recap briefly what, what we learned about since we crammed a lot into a short amount of time. Uh, really two things that we, we learned about and I want you to take from here. We learned what ductal dependent lesions are within the congenital heart disease realm, i.e. transposition of the great arteries, which belongs in that bucket labeled parallel circuits, i.e. bucket number two, which entails all of those lesions with insufficient pulmonary blood flow. And then finally, bucket number three, all those lesions that uh, entail insufficient systemic blood flow. We also learned about uh, which lesions require an atrial septostomy. The TGA with an intact atrial septum will require that in order for there to be adequate mixing uh, so that some some oxygenated blood uh, can can flow uh, from the RA to the RV, and then RV out the aorta to the rest of the body. 
than we learned about in similar fashion with hypoplastic left heart once that fully saturated oxygenated blood returns uh, from the lungs via the pulmonary veins to the left side of the heart in hypoplastic left heart there's very inadequate or even absent blood flow out the left ventricular outflow tract so there's nowhere for that blood that's fully oxygenated to go uh, and, and and no way for it to uh, perfuse the, the systemic circuit unless there's an atrial septum. And so if that atrial septum is restricted or, or closed, you'll need to have an atrial septosomy uh, in order to create that, that communication. And so once that has, has been done, blood can flow from the left atrium to RA, RA to RV, RV out the pulmonary artery, where then some of that blood that's not fully oxygenated, but adequately oxygenated with SATs, perhaps 75 to 85% uh, can flow from the pulmonary artery across the PDA and then PDA to the aorta and the rest of the body. So hopefully this was helpful. Hopefully it's enlightening. Um, this is stuff that for a long time I had just had to kind of sit sit down with and, and, and digest, and it's taken me a little bit of time um, to, to feel comfortable with it. So don't feel overwhelmed if, if it doesn't quite sink in initially takes a little bit of repetition. Hopefully this was helpful, guys. Um, as always, feel free to email me or uh, contact me with any questions, clarifications, or uh, suggestions to make this material better. Thanks so much. Bye. So at last, we've come to the end of the talk for week four. A really, really fascinating topic, something I get really excited to talk about. Hopefully some of my enthusiasm has rubbed off on you, and you'll be excited to learn even more about congenital heart disease. This was a lot jam-packed in a, a short period of time, so let's just briefly uh, recap what we've talked about. Really, we discussed two major things. We discussed ductal-dependent lesions, number one, and atrial septostomy-dependent lesions, number two. Number one, we know there are three categories that uh, will require a patent ductus arteriosus within the realm of congenital heart disease. We talked about parallel circuits, lesions with insufficient pulmonary blood flow, and lesions with insufficient systemic blood flow as being those three categories. Within atrial septostomy uh, dependent cardiac lesions, we know that um, transposition of the great arteries with an intact atrial septum and hypoplastic left heart with an intact atrial sep uh, septum fall within that category. And we talked about the pathway of blood and, and why that's the case, why they need that intraatrial communication uh, in order to uh, survive and, and survive to surgery. Hopefully these things have been interesting to you guys. Um, I'm always looking for bonus topics to uh, to make talks on, so please send me your suggestions uh, for this talk, guys. If you have any questions, um, clarifications, suggestions for, for what I can do better, uh, please let me know. I value your feedback. Just shoot me an email. Thanks so much. Till next time.